everybody. This is Alan with Meet the Filler Author. And for this episode of the podcast, I have uh, Brett uh, Godfrey on this morning. He's a, a, an attorney, a former uh, U.S. Air Force pilot, engineer. You've had a lot of, uh, you've done a lot of stuff and now you're an author. Uh, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So uh, can you tell us a little, uh, can you give a little uh, synopsis of your background or can you tell us a little bit about your background and what led you to sit down and write your first book? Well, sure. Um, you know, I've done a lot of different things for a living in my life. I was a chemical engineer at the Williams Companies for a while and uh, uh, went to law school and dropped out, went in the Air Force for a while, came back, finished my law degree. Um, and since then, I've just been practicing law. But I also do a lot of uh, public speaking and a lot of motivational speaking engagements, as well as training trial lawyers. I run a law firm in Denver that has been in business for 33 years. And I've tried 98 jury trials to verdict as lead counsel throughout the country. And I've got about 40 more trials where I was second chair. I have uh, spent many, many years flying airplanes. I've been asked to speak at Oshkosh about a twin engine failure over the Rockies in a blizzard that I experienced in a Cessna 421, which believe it or not, resulted in a safe landing uh, without engine power um, in the mountains. And it was a harrowing experience, but it's, it's received a lot of attention. Uh, I'm also a former professional, uh, excuse me, non-professional competitive skydiver. Um, and my team was highly ranked in the central U.S. Uh, and I did that for uh, eight years. Uh, been in the martial arts my whole life. I make 1911 guns and I paint. So those are my my activities outside of writing. Well, yeah, you have a creative, uh, a creative outlet. Yeah, I saw your paintings on your website. So they're very beautiful uh, uh, paintings of the uh, of nature and the outdoors. It's very nice. Yeah, la- I do mostly landscapes, um, but anybody that wants to see those can look at brettgodfrey.com and there's uh, about 60 or 70 paintings there. And so, um, so Black Sunrise, that's your first uh, uh, thriller, your first suspense thriller that, 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 you've, uh, that you've written, right? That is true. Yeah, and what's the, so can you tell us a little bit about that, about it? What's, uh, what's the story about? Well, I do love talking about it. Uh, Black Sunrise starts off with a kidnapping of two young adult women out of the Cherry Creek Mall in Denver, Colorado. And when they're abducted, uh, you, the reader, would know uh, pretty much immediately that The people who abduct them, there's two men that abduct abduct these two women, they're under surveillance by both a North Korean espionage cell and the uh, FBI uh, hostage rescue team. The uh, federal law enforcement of this country doesn't want to interrupt the kidnapping because they are aware of the fact that a North Korean cell has one of the two men under surveillance and turns out that what he does for a living is design viral weapons at a lab called Data Helix here in Colorado. And uh, the objective of the federal government is to let this play out so that they can roll up the whole North Korean uh, espionage apparatus in the United States. Uh, And they consider these two girls acceptable casualties. So when uh, the parents of the girls get together and figure out, you know, the police just don't seem interested in doing anything about this, they uh, go to an aging CIA officer for help. And he is a a former veteran of the Cold War, but he started his own espionage and intelligence, you know, private intelligence contracting and private military contracting agency called the Brecht Group. And the old man's name is Albert Brecht. But Albert Brecht was uh, shot in the head in Berlin, uh, you know, back in the early days of the Cold War. I guess I should say the mid days of the Cold War, 1958. And an American surgeon just happened to be with a a diplomatic entourage there and they tapped him to try to save this uh, dying agent because he held vital information in his head. And so the, the agent was Albert Brecht and he lives and recovers and prospers and has a full and happy life but he's always been plagued by an unpaid debt, and that is the debt he owed to the surgeon that saved him uh, on that cold, wet night, uh, you know, in a, a bad part of the world at the time. So we, he gets a phone call from the uh, son of the surgeon who saved him, who in turn says his own daughter is missing, meaning the, the, the granddaughter of the surgeon, 
he thinks of this as the opportunity of a lifetime to repay a debt that's weighed on him ever since. So that's the general premise of the story. Yeah, uh, it's, uh, I started reading it. Uh, I haven't finished it yet, but I started reading it. And uh, yeah, uh, it starts off with a bang right away with the, uh, the kidnapping of the two women. Uh, uh, so, um, you know, something that was interesting to me, uh, you, this book features a viral we a weapon, uh, a virus, and it came out right before uh, the whole <laughs> world is now dealing with a with, with a real virus. How, how did how did, was that surreal for you? You wrote this book, it came out, and then all of a sudden the whole world stops. <laughs> you you hit the word. It was surreal. It uh, some of my reviewers on Amazon say you know no one saw it coming, but Godfrey did, and uh, it's a pure coincidence that. Uh, the, the deadly viral weapon in Black Sunrise, uh, as soon as I released it upon the world in the form of a book, <laughs> then within uh, six months, we are now getting the first niggling warnings about uh, COVID-19. And here we have been in lockdown for, you know, almost a year and uh, we're coming up on, on uh, the release date for my next book. And I'm thinking, I, I wonder, <laughs> yeah, what, what's that about? Should we be nervous? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I'm hoping I haven't predicted the next big cataclysm. <laughs> and so this is a, so it's a part of a series, the the uh, Black Sunrise. Yeah, I'm working on two series simultaneously right now. Uh, the first one is what I call the Brecht Group series, um, and that that of course is Black Sunrise is the first book in that series. The second series, the second book in that series will be called Convergence of Demons, and it should be out in about uh, 10 weeks, I think. Um, it's ready to go through uh, multiple layers of editing, which is what we did with Black Sunrise. And then uh, I think we'll have the audiobook narrated before we release the book, so the audiobook comes out at the same time. Uh, in, in the case of Black Sunrise, it was on the market for eight or nine months before we had a uh, audio book done by George Widal, who narrates books for people like Vince Flynn. And uh, I'm trying to think of uh, whether yeah, or not, would, I don't think he's ever done any of your, your previous uh, superstar guests books. I listened to that uh, podcast with great interest when you had uh, Mark Greeny on. Yeah. Uh, and that was, that was really a treat to listen to that. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, a, he's a big, he's a big guy. The George G uh, Goodell, uh, Daniel Silva, and uh, yeah, that was that was been excited. Oh, about so him. you are already familiar with him? That's very good. Yeah, yeah. And he well, does he does yeah, all the, the Daniel Silva novels, which yeah, I the, adore. Yeah, when I heard you, when I heard the 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 audio that you sent me, I uh, he, it sounded familiar, so I looked it up. and I'm like, oh, that's why. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's, it's it sounds like that. George Weidel because it is George. Yeah. <laughs> So what was that whole process like the uh, the, the audiobook? He just gonna he goes away and does his thing, or how involved are you in that process? Uh, for the second book, you mean? No, no, for the audiobook. The audiobook. Could you, process. Could you ask the question again, please? Oh yeah, the uh, like the audiobook process. So how does that uh, how does that work? Does he just does George go away and and and, and does that? Well, George him? George, as I recall, lives in New York and he works with a sound laboratory in Los Angeles. And I, I wanted to, and let me point out, Black Sunrise is self-published, but I wanted to have the benefits of somebody like, like Silva, because, you know, you get to the end of one of his books and you read about all the fabulous assistance he's gotten from various editors and uh, consultants uh, with his publisher. So I thought, you know, these guys know what they're doing. Uh, I self-published his book with zero effort to find a publisher. Uh, because of an email exchange I'd had earlier with uh, a guy that pu he published a book on Amazon and it was just dead in the water. It went nowhere. And I was the seventh reviewer of the book and I, and I emailed him and we started an email conversation back and forth. And I said, I can't believe this thing isn't selling like hotcakes. And he says, I thought it would do better too. Well, then time went by and it became uh, very successful. It's called The Martian. Oh. <laughs> uh, by Andy Weir. <laughs> Never heard so, of that one. <laughs> yeah, and uh, and Andy Weir self-published initially, and and of course his book went viral and made into a movie with Matt Damon and so forth. But uh, I decided from that experience with Andy Weir that I wanted to self-publish Black Sunrise, 
and uh, it would either uh, live on its own or die on its own. But obviously, I do a lot to try to market the book, but it's doing extremely well. It's doing far better than I thought it would. So uh, once once I saw the success of it, I knew I needed an audio book. So I uh, decided to go straight to the best. So we contacted uh, George Woodall, and I think his first reaction was, what in the heck is this? Who's ever heard of this guy? And he said, you know, I don't usually do unknown people. I don't, uh, I don't do first novels. I don't do books for people that aren't pretty well established, like, you know, uh, Daniel Sylvan, Vince Flynn, people like that. So he, he then said, well, heck, just send me the first three chapters and I'll tell you if I'm even interested. And it was kind of an afterthought, you could tell. So I sent him the whole book as a PDF. He read the whole book and called me a week later, and he was excited. Um, and he was comparing me to Silva, and he was saying, you, you've you got it. You know, very few first writers have this, but you do. And he said, I'd be thrilled to do your book. And that was that. And the next thing you know, he calls me and tells me, uh, he called me a few times to ask how words are pronounced. But then he called me and said, I'm, I'm done. I think this is really going to do well. Uh, it's in the Sound Lab's hands in L.A. That took another 10 days. So the whole process took about three weeks. And uh, and then uh, I had to upload it onto audible.com. And it's now available on iTunes, Audible, uh, Amazon, and so forth. It's 12 and a half hours long. Uh, but the audiobook has pure five-star reviews. Uh, Black Sunrise is averaging about four and a half on Goodreads and Amazon with over a hundred ratings. Um, so it's still early days for it, but it's off to a terrific start. Yeah, yeah it's a fantastic start. And so could you describe um, your, um, for the listeners, like your writing process? Like uh, when, when you first get the idea, um, do you like do big outlines or do you just start to write? What's your writing process like? Well, I, I started working on my first, very first novel back when I was about 21. Uh, and that book was never published, nor did I try to publish it. I just wrote it. And uh, I went back and uh, reread that book, you know, decades later before getting serious about Black Sunrise. And I couldn't believe how bad it was. Uh, it was comically bad. It was almost worth publishing just for entertainment of how bad bad can get in writing. And so uh, over the years, though, I've always had an a obsession with being a writer. And I, I've written a lot of published articles that are technical things in the law and uh, some in medicine. But uh, the, the interesting thing is that as I was going along, I got to meet a lot of really big name authors. And uh, I came to know a fellow by the name of Wilbur Smith very well. And uh, I've spent an awful lot of time with Wilbur Smith. And I can tell you, the first thing I asked him was, what's your process? because I had just been through a seminar with C.J. Box, who's from Cheyenne, Wyoming. Actually, he's from Casper, but he lives in Cheyenne. And uh, uh, and I'm a Wyoming boy, and we're in the same class, you know, the same uh, high school class of 1978. But um, I asked him, what do you do with outlining and stuff? And he says, I outline extensively because I can't afford not to. I don't have the time to not outline. And that sounded really good. So. Uh, I decided to, and at that point I was halfway through Black Sunrise, so I decided to outline the second half of the book and uh, wrote this really excellent outline, I thought, and uh, put a lot of detail into it. And then the book rewrote itself in a totally opposite direction. So, <laughs> so I gave up on that. And uh, I remember listening to what Mark Greeny said on your show about how he just outlines the touchstones that he uh, then... Uh, uses just to kind of keep him on track, but he, he doesn't have a super systematic way of, of outlining. I'd say I'm more like that. Uh, I joke with my friends that the book writes itself. I, I think about the plot all the way through uh, for a long time before I start to write. And I make a lot of notes. I make a lot of research notes especially, but I don't, I don't outline chapter by chapter uh, having tried it uh, because my fingers won't cooperate with the outline. So I'm typing, and it's like I'm the original reader. I'm the first person to read the book, and I'm watching it happen on the screen. And uh, then obviously go back and edit like mad. Uh, but I don't censor myself at all while I'm writing. I think censorship, self-censorship is a form of, of self-abnegation or, or insecurity 
And I don't even believe in the word writer's block because I think writer's block is nothing more than your inner sensor gaining and holding control over you. Uh, I don't think anybody has a hard time creating. I think they have a hard time giving themselves permission to put it on paper because they start to doubt themselves immediately. And the next thing you know, they can't think of something that passes the inner, their inner filter. So they never write it. And that's called writer's block, but it's not really a block. It's censorship, self-censorship. And you, you're, you're, you're so busy with your, uh, your practice and the other thing, things that you do. Um, do you like, uh, do you write every day? Do you set time to write every day or what's, how does that work? No, I write about four days a week. Um, and I have to be careful what time I start because if I, if I started writing, say right now, we're recording this in the morning. And if I started writing now, I'd still be at it at nine o'clock at night. So I have to give myself permission, usually for about two and a half hours a day. Uh, and those are the best hours of my day. And, uh, and and so do you, um, how has, has the pandemic, uh, did, did it, has it changed anything for you, for your writing? Uh... Well, yeah, you know, uh, I had planned to be on a uh, lecture circuit and I'd had a lot of feedback from independent booksellers like uh, the Tattered Cover Bookstore and, and others. And uh, I was uh, quickly aware that I could have a, a, a national speaking circuit if I wanted to at bookstores. And I really wanted to do that. I thought that would be an excellent boost for the book. And then pandemic hit, and I've been sitting in this chair ever since. <laughs> yes, that is surreal. <laughs> and um, and um, and what about the, um, um, the the as a reader when you were growing up? Were you a fan of thrillers and 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 these type of books? Of this oh, genre? very very much so. When when I was, I think the first time I thought I wanted to be a writer was I fell in love with a 60s vintage uh, thriller writer who almost invented the genre uh, by the name of Alastair McLean. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure you've heard of him. Yeah. And uh, I just adored his books. And, and the type of story he told was so gripping for me that I knew then that's the type of story I wanted to tell. So uh, having read all those books, I tried to write like Alastair McLean. And, and that wasn't enough exposure. And then the very next really big thriller writer that I ever encountered was Wilbur. Um, I read a book of his called The Delta Decision, which in uh, Europe was released as uh, Wild Justice, I believe. And uh, I fell absolutely in love with Wilbur. I thought Wilbur was probably the best in the world. And a lot of people seem to agree with me on that. Um, and then of course, fell in love with Tom Clancy and but when I was about 16, I read a book called The Black Samurai, uh, which was the first of a Pulp Fiction series called The Black Samurai series. It was written by Mark Olden. And Mark and I got to be very good friends. Uh, at my office, I have the original cover art for Black Samurai number one uh, that was gifted to me by Mark Olden. We stayed in touch for decades. And uh, in fact, one of his characters is in Black Sunrise. Oh, so, so you, even when you were, even before you started to write the first book, this the first book, you've been you said it from the beginning you've been wanting to do this for a long time. So was that always in the back of your head, no matter what you were doing? You're like, I, I want yes, to writing. Absolutely, absolutely. When I was in fifth grade, I was reading a, a pulp fiction series that was really awful called Dark Shadows, <laughs> uh -huh. and it was uh, it was based on the, uh, the 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 soap opera, yeah, the, the very movie. first vampire soap opera yeah. that we ever had in this world was Dark Shadows, and um, I read those books and I liked them. They were they were bad, but I was in fifth grade. I didn't know any better. And so I would sit down with a spiral notebook and I'd write my own with a pencil. I'd write my own uh, Dark Shadows short stories. And I wrote about 40 of those uh, while I was in fifth grade. And uh, one day we had an assignment in writing that said, write a story, a fiction story, you know, make it your own. It's got to be at least two pages long or four pages long, something like that. By that time, I had a half inch thick stack of, of Dark Shadows short stories I'd already written. So I just turned all those in. And the teacher was, I got an A. And the teacher was uh, like, wow, that's a lot of writing for a fifth grader. Uh, no, that's, that's cool to, to even uh, wanting to do this for so long and now just seeing it all come to fruition. That must be exciting. Yeah, the, the thing that's exciting 
first, I, I wrote the book just so that I could experience the pleasure of putting forward the best book I was capable of writing and, and not cutting any corners. But I didn't expect the, the ratings that I have, the, the reviews and the feedback and the success this book has already started to experience. That caught me off guard. I didn't expect that. Yeah, because that's always kind of the, the when you, especially your first book, you're, you're, you're kind of like, how, how's the world going to react to it? So it's kind of great when you start getting that, that great feedback back. Well, a lot of my reviewers said, boy, I hope this is a series. And uh, one lady sent me an email and said, is there going to be a sequel to Black Sunrise? And I said, well, read it in the back. It says there will be. So. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, read the back matter. <laughs> but my second series that I'm working on is called the Killick series. And uh, Killick's Detour is the first book, and it starts in 1938 in Houghton Lake, Michigan. Uh, and it takes a lot of interesting twists. It, uh, it involves a visitor from a faraway world who accidentally finds himself in Michigan in the winter. <laughs> so, okay. Like a sci-fi thriller uh, twist to it, huh? Yeah, it's got a little bit of, you know, the. Uh, I'm trying to remember the name of the, you know, like the world according to Garp. Yeah, John Irvin. Um, yeah. Or, yeah, that kind of thing where you see that a lot of the world's major events are all tied to one thing somewhere. Yeah. That's a, that's a, that's a, a plot, uh, 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 tactic that's been used by lots of people in movies and it's also in books. Uh, but, uh, the, the series spans a hundred years and, uh, starts off in 1938 in Michigan and ends up in, uh, Washington DC in the year 2038. And, uh, a lot of things happen, but I can tell you that my my visitor from another world is standing next to Oppenheimer when Oppenheimer says, I am death, destroyer of worlds. He's talking to Killick. Yeah. And because uh, without Killick's help, maybe the bomb wouldn't have come out. So there's that. And what was it like uh, now when you're writing a book set in the 30s? Um, was that challenging, like to get the era correctly and and all that. It's well, I'm still, I'm, I haven't quite finished that novel yet, but uh, what a thrill. I mean, it it opened up a door for me because I, I researched very hard. All the good writers research hard. I mean, you know that. But um, I, what I, the time I spend on research is, is obscene. Uh, you know, I've already got probably a thousand hours of research into, kill, into uh, Convergence of Demons, but, um, you know, the, the, the thought is you can get on web pages and you can read newspapers and magazines from any given year. So if you if you go on the variety of websites that do this, you could read, you know, like uh, the Chicago Times and other other uh, periodicals from that year and you get a good feel for the culture. And of course, you can go back and watch, you know, old black and white movies that were made in that time frame and get a sense of it, but those movies didn't uh, have the candid recollection of society that we see in movies today. So everything's perfect and everything's dolled up, but you still get a sense of how people spoke, what technologies existed. In 1938, did they have cell phones? No. Uh, uh, did they have anything? You know, yeah, you had electric lights and <laughs> cars and <laughs> all kinds of things. And in fact, by 1938, people in this country thought they were living in a very high tech society. <laughs> you know, because we had assembly line automobiles and we had, uh, you know, by that time we had x-ray machines. We had uh, a variety of medical tests that people think are only recent developments. Uh, the, the world of physics had come a great long way because by that time uh, Einstein had written both the general and special theories of relativity. Uh, you know, we knew about black holes. We knew about the space-time continuum, we were starting to understand about gravity. That's all in place. In fact, in 1938, Howard Hughes set a, a record for a transcontinental airplane flight in the United States. Uh, so, you know, that was nonstop, I think, from New York to San Francisco, I, I believe. And, uh, uh, and it was a speed record. So, you know, the, the, the 30s, especially the late 30s, are more advanced than people give them credit for being. 
Yeah, it's kind of mind-boggling. Yeah, it was 80, 90 years ago, but yeah, it's uh, you, you always read about that stuff too. I'm like, wow, I, I, could, I didn't realize they were doing that. And I'm committed to making that time period as ex, ex, exactly accurate as I possibly can. Yeah. So the research is fun. I get lost in the politics of the 30s and uh, organized crime is becoming a huge problem. Mm. And uh, it's, it's just fun, 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 fun to do that research. And it really beefs the book up. It gives it much more realism, much more life and more interest. Plus, you get a lot of great ideas. From real you, events. And do you still find time to read? Or are you, uh, do you still read in the genre? Or I, I do. Um, I You know, yesterday I downloaded, uh, I can't remember the name of, of uh, Greeny's latest book. Um, yeah, Relentless. Yeah, I downloaded Relentless yes, two days ago. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm just now finishing up uh, the latest Lincoln slash child uh, book, which is... Uh, really really good I, I love douglas preston lincoln child mm -hmm. uh, and I, I read voraciously i read about 150 books a year because uh, i'm addicted <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah uh, and um so what's uh, what's next for you you say you're working on the sequel for about black sunrise uh, what are you working what's in, in this other book Is that so that's coming out this year or yeah uh, convergence demons should be out in about 10 weeks i think okay. And uh, the manuscript is 10 hours away from being completed. Uh, so the next thing I'll do is go through and take off my creative hat and put on my technician hat and do the best editing job I know how to do. And then it will go from, from me to a developmental editor. And I may use, I used as my developmental editor for Black Sunrise, I had the guy that, uh, that uh, Andy Weir used for The Martian. And uh, so he's a developmental editor. So he's looking at the way the story flows or hanging things that shouldn't be left hanging or things like that or plot inconsistencies, et cetera. So that's his job is to go find all that stuff. And then it goes to a copy editor who is looking for punctuation and grammar and s style and syntax and usage and all that stuff. Uh, then it goes from there to the sound guy. Uh, I'm sorry, to the uh, voiceover talent. Uh, I may use uh, George Woodall again. He he told me he'd be happy to do another one for me, and uh, uh, but I'm also looking at a couple of other uh, voiceover talents that are pretty well known, and uh, I haven't spoken to them to determine their interest yet. But uh, then when that's all done, the actual publication of a completed work, if it's in good shape, uh, is bloody simple. Yeah, exciting. And then the. Uh, I always ask uh, my guests about uh, what they used to write. Do you use like, is, is this Word or do you use uh, another type of software? I, I wrote Black Sunrise in Word mm -hmm. and then I had to <clears throat> format the imprint. I first used uh, Amazon's own imprint software. Didn't like that, so I did my own imprint uh, and put it out as a PDF with all the margins exactly right and everything. Um, I'm very good at that stuff because I also do graphic design. But uh, then I realized all those things I was doing would be far easier if I didn't use Word. Mm -hmm. And I know there's a lot of apps that writers like, but I really like Pages. I'm an Apple Mac user, and Pages makes it so easy to, to format a book exactly the way you want. And uh, so I'm, I, I have written all of Convergence of Demons on, on Pages. Oh, okay. Oh, cool. Yeah, I, I noticed on pages they have like templates and everything. Uh, which you bet. That's pretty cool. I, I designed my own so that it'll look like Black Sunrise. Mm. Uh, but uh, I, I think it looks nice in print. I like the, I use the uh, Apple Garamond Pro font for my text. Um, and it reads well. It's easy on the eyes. Of course, anyone downloads an ebook, they can select some fonts on their ebook. Uh, and then the hardback has the same imprint as the paperback. All right, Brett. Well, before I let you go, I always like to, uh, last question I'd like to ask my guests is uh, for the aspiring writers that are listening to this, any advice? Yeah, I, I have two good pieces of advice. One I got from Stephen Hunter, and because uh, I asked him that question. Uh, and I said, you know, do you, what's your best piece of advice to an aspiring writer? And he says, finish the book. <laughs> He says, the number one reason people don't have books out is they didn't finish it. 
And he says, the idea that you're going to create sample chapters and float those by a publicist or an agent or even a publisher and, and have a book contract from five sample chapters is just not really true. He says, you want a fighting chance, especially when you're starting out, get that book perfect, finish it and, and make it your best work, cut no corners. If you're tired, then stop for a bit and come back, but don't take, don't cut corners, don't take it easy. Get your book done. That's my first piece of advice. My second piece of advice is, if you're not sure that you have it in you to do it, assume that you do, and and don't don't shut yourself down. Avoid self-imposed limitations. Uh, was a quote by Bruce Lee. Um, but I, those are my two pieces. Great, that's great advice. And the and the listeners can find you at your website. It's probably the best place. It's at brettgodfrey.com, right? Yeah, I, I have pages on. A lot of other places but but that's the one that is the easiest to see where the books are there's sample chapters on the website at brettgodfrey.com and uh you can see the paintings you can you can read the sample chapters you get links to download the books um, and there's a few other little tricky things in there all right well thanks so much for uh, being on the podcast enjoy talking to you uh, about your work you bet one last thing let me throw in sure on that website, those tricky little things, those are uh, professionally done videos by a, a professional grade production company. Um, they're fun. They're really fun videos. Oh, I'll have to go check those out. So that for your books, like book trailers or? Yep, oh. yep. We're actually filming the book trailer for Black Sunrise right now. Uh, we've, we've selected our acting cast and the screenplay was written by another person. But uh, that's gonna look like a trailer for a movie and it's, it's as good as you're gonna see. Oh, that's exciting. Yeah, cool. All right, great. Well, thanks for being on the show. Thanks for having me.